You're listening to the weekly sermon at Second Baptist Church in Cedartown, Georgia. Second Baptist Cedartown exists to worship God, disciple believers, and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, willingness. Uh, turn with me, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. We're going to be closing out this first letter. Uh, that Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. And then we're going to get into the second letter next week. Uh, and the second letter is a little shorter, so we won't spend as much time as we have on the first letter. But there are some similar themes and some things that we're going to continue to uh, explore and, and to uh, discuss as we uh, look at standing firm in our walk with the Lord and growing in faithfulness, growing in our love and devotion to the Lord and to his mission. And uh, specifically together, I want to talk about uh, growing in sanctification together as the church and brothers and sisters in Christ as we come together and as we seek the Lord and as we grow in our walk with the Lord, what does that look like and how do other Christians help us to grow in our walk with the Lord. So if you found your place, let's all stand out of respect of God's word this morning. 1 Thessalonians 5, starting in verse 16, we read these words from Paul. Rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Don't stifle or quench the spirit. Don't despise prophecies, but test all things. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will do it. Brothers and sisters, pray for us also. Greet All the brothers and sisters with a holy kiss, I charge you by the Lord that this letter be read to all the brothers and sisters. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for your word. Thank you that, Lord, it is relevant and true and trustworthy. And God, we pray that we apply your word to our lives rightly as so many things shift and change right in front of us in an ever-changing world. Lord, help us to cling to your word that never changes. The truth that we can hold close to our heart. Help us to grow in faithfulness, Lord, as you have been so faithful to us. And we ask that you bless this time together. We ask you to bless the reading of your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This letter, as we have spent a good bit of time the past few months talking about, this letter is written to a particular group of people in the context of the local assembly of believers there in Thessalonica, the church in Thessalonica. Paul had worked with these Christians. He had invested in their walk with the Lord for a few years. We discussed that about how He had a heart for this church, for this mission. There were uh, pastoral uh, guidance, pastoral guidance that was given to the church. And you can see his heart for the people there in Thessalonica as you read through this letter. And I just encourage you, if you still have those scripture notebooks that we were giving away uh, at the beginning of this time, you guys look through that notebook, read through it, and meditate on uh, these words, and go ahead and go through the, the second letter to the Thessalonians that were there, and uh, and just meditate and think about those words, and think about what Paul had in mind for those Christians, and what the Holy Spirit has in mind for us today as we grow in sanctification. And maybe you just read it out loud, or maybe you get Alexa to read it to you, or something along those lines, and you just meditate on the word. Uh, because there's so much here that is helpful for us about our walk with the Lord and growing in our faith. He, he cared deeply for them. He was glad to hear 
that they were growing in their faith. There was a question about where they were in their walk with the Lord. Had they succumbed to the temptations around them? Had they uh, been uh, confused or misled by other heresies? There were questions that uh, churches at that time had to wrestle with. Churches today have to wrestle with. But ultimately, he hears back from uh, the Thessalonian Christians, and he hears that, that God is doing a good work in them, and that they are continuing to grow in their faith, continuing to grow in their love with one another. So a part of his exhortation to them is to just keep going, to just stay faithful, to stay the course, to stand firm as he tells them to do. And we know that the ministry of the church in Thessalonica wasn't without its problems. All groups of people have their problems. Uh, the church is not immune from that. And yet they had stayed the course in the midst of that. There were external pressures that the church faced. In Thessalonica specifically, Paul was kicked out of the city for preaching the gospel. There were people in the city of Thessalonica hostile to the message of the gospel. There were external pressures on those Christians. If they were to remain faithful, there are going to be issues that come up. There are external pressures today. We've talked about several of those things. Now, I don't think we're going to get kicked out of Cedartown for preaching the gospel, but I do think that there is more social pressure today in us living out our faith in us reading Scripture and applying Scripture to our lives. There are external pressures that we deal with day in and day out if you're going to be faithful to the Lord and to His plan for your life. But then there are internal pressures within the church as well. Internal tensions that happen sometime within the church, within uh, brothers and sisters in Christ even. And I like what uh, Michael Martin, a theologian, wrote about this particular passage and about the church and the nature of the church in general. He said, the Christian assembly in Thessalonica, indeed the church in most instances, is a complex entity including a variety of personalities. There are leaders and there are followers. There are those who are weak in the faith and those who are strong in the faith. There are the optimists and the pessimists, the cynical and the gullible. These and others must coexist in the church even more than that, they must learn how to love one another and work with one another for the encouraging and the building up of one another. The church is a unique organization. The church is the people of God that have been called out and have been sanctified for the particular purpose of serving the Lord and growing together. But because we're imperfect, because we don't always do what is right, we bring all of our stuff in the midst of that. We bring all of our baggage. We bring even the good things, sometimes our personalities and our differences and all the rest. But I want to pause for a moment, and I want to remind you of this. We should thank God for the church. Thank God for the church. Because there are brothers and sisters in Christ who help us, who pray for us, who encourage us, who show up in our time of need. And we see that time and time again. People who are imperfect and yet they, they love and they care for the needs of others because they have been given grace from an almighty God because they have been loved by Jesus and they want to love in return. Who is it that shows up in natural disasters and in issues where people lose their homes? It's the church. It's Christians who come together. Who is it who goes into third world countries and help feed the poor and help build infrastructure? It's the church that supports that and continues to go on mission. Who is it that, that offers the hope of mankind to the world through the gospel of the Lord Jesus? It's the church. The church that has been given that mandate. No, the church in and of itself with the people that are involved, the people are not perfect. But I can, can I tell you, the mission that God has called us to is a good and perfect mission that God will bless if these people, if, if his people come together to bring glory to his name. Thank God for the church. It's a good thing to be a part of the local church and the universal church. And so when our own, in our own spiritual walk with the Lord, God can use others to encourage us, to challenge us at times, to, to test us, and to ultimately 
grow us in our walk with the Lord. So my main point this morning is God provides brothers and sisters in Christ to help grow areas of our Christian walk. And I want to look at a a few specific areas this morning where the church helps us to grow in our walk with the Lord. All of these things are, are good and godly things, things that help us to grow closer to the Lord. Sarah and I were talking about spiritual disciplines last night, about reading the Bible, about praying, and about you know, all the things that you know, you're supposed to do in your walk with the Lord and growing in sanctification and everything else. And, and, and the truth is, I read, I read a book a while back that just changed my whole perspective about spiritual disciplines because, because the goal ultimately is not just to read the Bible more. The goal is not just to pray more. The goal is not just to, just to do good things more and all the rest. The goal, the ultimate goal, is to grow in your relationship with God. To know Him. To know Him and, and to make Him known. And the spiritual disciplines help us do that, obviously. As I read Scripture, as I pray, as I come to worship, as I do what, what God's called me to do, then, then ultimately you do cultivate a relationship with God. But I want you to focus on this. The goal in the Christian life is to know God and to make Him known. The goal in the Christian life, the goal of sanctification is to know God and to make Him known. That's what we're striving for because His presence makes all the difference in the world. His presence gets us through the circumstances of life. His presence is what guides us, gives us wisdom and discernment and everything else. So so there was a question that that John Wesley, the founder of Methodism and, and a lot of his Sunday school groups that he helped to found, there was a question that they would ask themselves and they would ask the members of their Sunday school class very often. And this question is something that can would rock the very foundation of your soul if you really think about it. It was a simple question, but it was a, a helpful question to get them to think about where they are in their walk with the Lord and, and, and how they're growing in sanctification. The question was this. How is it with your soul? How is it with your soul? They would ask that question often. And I want to ask you the same question today. How is it with your soul? Are there things that that could change? Are there things that you could grow in? Are you close in your walk with the Lord? With your family? With others that you love? That you care for? That you're helping to disciple? How is it in their walk with the Lord? With your church? How is it in our walk with the Lord today? How is it with your soul? So I want to look at a few things that I think uh, God helps us to grow in, in our walk with Him, and how we can grow in sanctification, becoming more and more like His Son every day. Not perfect here on this earth, and yet in glory, one day all things will be made perfect. The first thing that brothers and sisters in Christ can help us to grow in is joy. And the Holy Spirit that's at work in the life of the church can help us grow in joy. He says in verse 16 of chapter 5, rejoice always. Now, if you need to memorize some Bible verses, this is a pretty good place to look. They're all very short. (laughs) Rejoice always, pray constantly. Give thanks thanks in everything, everything, for this this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. But I want to focus on that idea. Rejoice Rejoice always. How is it possible to always rejoice? How is it possible to be consistent in our joy? To be unwavering in our joy? Doesn't it seem like at times it would be impossible considering the circumstances of this world? I'm going to be honest with you, joy is not the first thing that crosses my mind when you're faced with difficult problems. When you're faced with difficult circumstances. When when your kids go wild and, and the house is a mess. Are you joyful? In the midst of that, is joy the first thing that comes to your mind? When you're having challenges at work with coworkers or with bosses or with what you're supposed to be doing day in and day out work, beats you up and all the rest. Are you joyful? Is, is joy the first thing that comes to your mind? Are you able to consistently be joyful in that? When you get the diagnosis from the doctor that you didn't want, is it easy to find joy in that? 
when they get your order wrong at McDonald's for the two millionth time is joy the first thing you think of when all these things go wrong. No, naturally, joy is not the first inclination, the first response that we have according to our flesh when we go through various circumstances in life. But, but I want to tell you this, our joy, if it's to be consistent, our joy, if it is to, to continue always, it must be rooted in Christ and not our circumstances. Our joy is not rooted in the things that happen around us. Our, our joy is rooted in the person of Jesus. Jesus said in John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. So think about that. Think about that in, in living out joy in your life and growing in joy. Are you bearing fruit because you're connected to the vine? Are you, are you growing in joy ultimately because you're connected to Jesus and you're cultivating that connection? Jesus. I want to give you a few practical ways to grow in joy according to Scripture. Maybe some things that will be helpful day in and day out when we when we do face difficult circumstances. How do we how do we continue in joy? How do we rejoice always, as Paul says here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5? Well, the first thing is this to abide in Christ. John chapter 15. Again, verse 11, it says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. He, he's, he's giving this in the context of him being the vine, us being the branches, and he tells us this so that our joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Joy comes from abiding in Jesus. Joy comes from staying connected to Jesus and resting. In his promises, in his provision, in his faithfulness, abiding in Christ. Secondly, joy comes from the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, again, joy is not something we all naturally go to or that we all naturally possess and that we, it's our first response, our first inclination. Oftentimes, if we were to rely on the flesh, we would not go to joy we would go to something else. But, but joy is a work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Joy that surpasses all of our circumstances is a work of the Spirit. Galatians 5 verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Joy is the fruit of the Spirit, the, the evidence of the Spirit at work in your life and in mine. So what does that mean for us practically? It means that we remember, ultimately, this joy that we possess is not based on our works, but based on the works of the Holy Spirit, and we rest in that. We rest in His presence. Thirdly, trust in God in trials. And that's no fun. That's no fun to go through trials. But it is wonderful to know that God goes through those trials with us. James chapter 1 verse 2 says this, and this is amazing to me. If you look this up and you really think about the depth of these words, he says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Who in the world, who in the world considers it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds? Can I tell you, that's joy that can only come from God. Joy that can only come from God. He says this, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. You know that God's going to use that. God's going to use the difficult circumstances in your life to cultivate joy. And so, as we cultivate that relationship, as we grow in sanctification, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. And then, fourthly, how do we grow in joy? I think this is one very practical way. It's through exercising gratitude and contentment. Contentment is a word that we don't particularly like in this culture, in our society. Because none of us are content. None of us are, are satisfied in the essence of the way things are. We're, we're taught to always progress, to always push for something new, to always have some sort of goal or ambition ahead of us. And, 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 and honestly, the, the unending uh, mantra of our day is constantly focused on progress, constantly something new. 
and something fresh and all the rest. But, but, but sometimes God just wants us to stay put and God just wants us to be content with what he has given us. Contentment is what God would have us to pursue so often in life. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, verse 18. Paul again says this when we focus on rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. Give thanks in all circumstances. Why? Because this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Fifthly, a few more that I want to focus on with joy. Focusing on our eternal hope. That keeps us going in the right direction. Romans 15, verse 13. May the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Focusing on that hope that we have in Jesus. And then a couple more, loving and serving others. You know what helps cultivate joy so often is when we forget about ourselves and our needs and we focus on the needs of other people. Acts 20, verse 35, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Isn't that the truth? And then lastly, praising and worshiping God. When we come together, when we worship corporately together as a church, Psalm 16, verse 11 tells us this. You make known to me the path of life. In, in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In the presence of God there is fullness of joy. I don't always get joy from the circumstances of this world. But can I tell you what God has to offer you and offer me is pure joy. Aren't you thankful for that, church? We'll look at this as we look at what we can grow in and how other believers help us to grow in this. We look at joy, but secondly, we look at prayer. We look at prayer. and We look at verse 17. Pray constantly. Pray constantly. Well, there's personal prayer, there's group prayer, and then there's corporate prayer. I, I want to think about these in three different categories. Personal prayer is the prayer that we commit to on a very personal level by ourselves with the Lord, maybe while you're driving down the road, maybe in your prayer closet, maybe uh, doing things on your own, and you pray to the Lord, and, and some of the best prayer meetings I've ever had is just me and Jesus. Personal prayer, are you growing fervently in that? Group prayer, and by this I, I mean, you know, small groups, maybe one or two people, two or three that are gathered together, that pray together. There have been times when I've prayed one-on-one -on -one with someone, and that just meant the world to me. It helped cultivate uh, and grow my prayer life in so many ways. And then there's corporate prayer, where you usually have one person that, that prays in an entire group, a large group of people, but we all pray silently or individually, and we're all committed to, to fervent prayer collectively together. Prayer in all contexts, then. Regardless of if we're talking about personal prayer, group prayer, or corporate prayer, prayer in all contexts helps us grow our relationship with the Lord. And we need fervent prayer lives in all of those contexts. If we lean, if we lean on one area of prayer over another, our walk with the Lord will suffer. Here's what I mean by that. If you, if you neglect personal prayer, you say, I don't ever just pray to the Lord by myself. And yet you do pray when you come together corporately as a church. And, and you, you think, well, man, that was good. I love praying with my brothers and sisters in Christ. That's wonderful. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. That's good. But you cannot neglect your personal prayer life because there will be things that come up in your life that will be challenging because it's out of that overflow that you pray and that you remember to pray uh, in other contexts. And it's the same way vice versa, right? You, you can pray alone and that's wonderful and that's great, but if you neglect corporate prayer, if you neglect the prayer of God's people, if you neglect and you forget exactly how, how wonderful and glorious it is to come together as a church and to pray and you lose your fervency in that area, can I say it's going to impact other areas of your life as well. We need the Lord, and we need to pursue the Lord together. One of the things I love about some of the mission trips that we've been on as a church is you see how other churches come together and pray. And the church that, that we worked with in El Salvador, many of y'all worked with and worshipped with in El Salvador. I remember it was probably the most prayerful church I've ever been in. When the church service was starting, people were still coming in, but they were just praying 
they were just praying as, as people were coming in, as the ushers helped them to find seats and helped us find seats and all the rest. Someone was up on stage and they were praying and they were fervently pursuing the Lord in prayer. When was the last time you poured your heart out to God in prayer and you asked God to lead and guide you in, in so many ways? I, I've, I've benefited in so many ways from the prayers of others and brothers and sisters coming together to pray, hearing my brothers and sisters pray, oftentimes will grow fervency in our own lives, knowing that they're praying for me, knowing that, that someone is praying for you, even when you're apart. Isn't it a wonderful blessing when someone says, I prayed for you, and you know that they prayed for you? What a great gift that is from the Lord. Listening to children pray. Don't y'all love that? Amen. It's some of the funniest stuff when you think about the things that they pray for, and, and some of those precious things that they pray for. Uh, there, there was one child who's grown up now who was in uh, one of the churches we were serving in, and, and oftentimes he was called on to pray in church in the middle of the service, and it was, I always looked forward to hearing him pray. I was always thankful when somebody called on him to pray, and he prayed in the middle of a church service because it was just so pure, and it was heartfelt. I remember growing up as a, as a child in my home church, there was an older gentleman who was called on to pray often. And uh, y'all know there's some folks who just like to pray a really long time. Y'all ever been around those folks? And this guy was called on to pray often in the church. And I'm just going to be honest with you, when, when somebody called on him to pray in the church, we just all sat down because <laughs> we knew it was going to be a while. He prayed for a solid, I timed him one time, 10 minutes. And it was you say, preacher, you should have been praying. You're right. I should have been praying instead of timing him. But he would pray for everything. And this man was, was, was such a blessing to us. But, man, he didn't leave any stone uncovered. One time in the middle of a service, he prayed for the service. He prayed for the preacher. Then he started praying for everybody outside the church. And he didn't leave any stone uncovered. He even prayed for the moonshiners in that particular service. I thought, Lord, help the moonshiners. I mean, <laughs> it's on his heart. We need to pray for him. And... But it's wonderful, when you think about it, to hear other believers pray because they can help cultivate prayer in our own life. Martin Luther said this about prayer. To be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. We need constant communication with God because we depend on God. Charles Spurgeon said, True prayer is neither a mere mental exercise nor a vocal performance. It's far deeper than that. It's a spiritual transaction with the creator of heaven and earth. Do we forget that sometimes when we're praying to God, when we're praying individually, when we're praying corporately? It's a spiritual transaction with the creator of heaven and earth. C.S. Lewis said, I pray because I can't help myself. I pray because I'm helpless. I pray because the need flows out of me all the time, waking and sleeping. It doesn't change God, it changes me. We are in desperate need of growing in prayer and to be a prayerful people. Thirdly, we can grow in thanksgiving. With our brothers and sisters in Christ, we, we grow in thanksgiving. Verse 18, give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We should have as a primary goal in the Christian life to grow in thanksgiving, to grow in gratitude to the Lord. In our busy, fast-paced life, it's even more important to take time to slow down and to be thankful. And listen, thankfulness is rooted in contentment. Godliness with contentment is great gain, is what Scripture tells us. But thankfulness, gratitude, is rooted in contentment. It's hard to be content when we're constantly searching and working for more. And when we're so busy that we don't slow down to, to just thank God for who He is. There's, there's joy and simplicity, and that will cultivate contentment and thanksgiving in our life. Just, when was the last time you paused and you said, God, thank you for today. Thank you for all those blessings. Thank you for waking me up this morning. Well, you didn't have to. You, 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 didn't, you didn't have to use me today, but thank you for that. Thank you for providing, Lord. I mean, we, we oftentimes will pray before a meal, and sometimes we go through the motions and everything else. But, and I know groceries are expensive, amen and amen. But when was the last time you said earnestly and genuinely, God, thank you for providing this, because I, I have food on my table, God. I have a roof over my head, God. Thank you for all that you have done for me. Oftentimes we use, we use prayer 
as this tool to, to, to get things from God. But when was the last th time that you just spent time in prayer, not asking for anything, but just thanking God? Lord, I come to you and I'm not, I'm not asking you for anything. I just want to give you thanks, Lord. I just want to give you thanks for all that you have done. Praying for God to change your heart, to rid your heart of the constant desire to always want more, to always feel like there, there's more, never being fully satisfied, never being fully content. But when was the last time we, we prayed for forgiveness of that? Every night, usually every night, we, uh, when we're getting kids in the bed, a lot of times we say the Lord's Prayer together at, at night, and, uh, and we say it together out loud, and, and uh, we'll pray uh, with Jack and Maggie. And, uh, you know, the other night we were praying the Lord's Prayer, and, and Jack and I both messed it up at one part. And I don't know why, where we got off track, but then we paused and we're like, man, we just messed that up all over. But, but there's so much to learn in the Lord's Prayer if you just break down the contents of what God, uh, what Jesus is teaching us to pray, how he's teaching us to pray. So much to learn from that. And listen, it, it, it's not some sort of magical recantment that we just that we share and we, we say these words and everything else is good. The disciples went to Jesus and they said, teach us to pray. And Jesus said, pray like this. And he says a few words that if you look at the contents of that prayer, there's so much that we can learn from. And I've broken this down at times when we've taught on this special on Wednesday nights about ACTS, ACTS. If you took this acronym and you look at the contents of the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer, this should, these things should be included in all of our prayers. A, adoration. And we see this in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, He's high and lifted up. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. He says, hallowed be thy name. Holy is your name. We should spend time in prayer adoring God. Not, not simply for what He's done, but for who He is. But for who He is. Adoration. Our Father who art in heaven. And then confession. He, he asks that, that we pray this way. Forgive us of our trespasses. Forgive us of our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. Then we confess our sin to the Lord. How, how much do we focus on confession in our prayers? Asking for forgiveness from God in our prayers. T, A-C-T, is this. Thanksgiving. How much in our prayers do we pause and give thanks to God? I think we see that in what Jesus says as he prays to the Father, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's, uh, that's praying for God's will, but that's also praying for contentment because sometimes God is going to do things in your life and it's not going to line up with your hopes, with your dreams, with your aspirations, but we still submit to the will of God. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Being content with God's plan. Being thankful for God's plan. And then lastly, supplication. This is what we usually focus on in prayer. But to ask for things from God because He's a good and a gracious God. Jesus says to pray like this. Give us this day our daily bread. To pray for the uh, spiritual and physical nourishment that we need. But, but again, I want to focus on that idea of thanksgiving. How often, how often do we need to grow in thanksgiving in the Lord? Being a thankful people. And I'll tell you, God can really use a thankful people. God, God can really use a people that are characterized by gratitude. And lastly, I want to focus on this in closing. And think about how the church, our brothers and sisters in Christ, help us to grow in sanctification. We'll look at worship and discipleship. Worship and discipleship. We help, we are to grow in those areas. He says, don't stifle the Spirit. Don't quench the Spirit. Don't despise prophecies, but test all things. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. You see worship and discipleship so much in those few verses there. When we gather for worship, and we gather in the name of Jesus, and we sing praises to God, and we we gather with the intended purpose of glorifying God. God tells us that He's there in the midst of us. His presence is there. Sometimes we think about the presence of the Holy Spirit as, as, as if we're just trying to catch air, as if we're throwing things in the air or, 
are, are just just the, this, this, this thing that you just can't quite catch or that is elusive to you and, and you try to get the presence of the Holy Spirit, but he, but he runs away and you can't find the presence of the Holy Spirit. Listen, the Bible doesn't describe the Holy Spirit in that way. The Bible tells us this. The psalmist particularly says this. Wherever I go, wherever I am, there you are. If I were to go up into the heavens, there you are. If I were to lay my bed in Sheol, the psalmist says, or, or the place of the dead, there you are. He says, your presence is inescapable. Your presence is inescapable. And can I tell you that if you gather in God's house with God's people to worship God, the Holy Spirit is there among you. The Holy Spirit is there. The only question is, Spiritually, are we there? Are we there? Are we in tune with the Holy Spirit? Or do we try to, as Paul says, quench the Spirit? To quench the Spirit. To grow in worship is to grow in awareness of God's presence and to grow in awareness of God's truths. He says, test all things, hold on to what is good. And that's critically important in worship and in discipleship. When you think about growing in our walk, sanctification is just a fancy word. But it, it literally means just being set apart for a particular purpose, for growing in your walk with the Lord. And God has a plan, God has a purpose for you. And for that purpose to be cultivated over a long period of time. And when we live in a world that is characterized by instant gratification, we have to remind ourselves that sanctification is a process. Sanctification takes time. In, in, a, in a microwave world, we have to remember that sanctification is like cooking in a crock pot. <laughs> it's different. It takes time to cultivate those things. I want you to imagine I want you to imagine a beautiful garden filled with flowers, trees, and shrubs. Maybe you've got a particular place that you have in mind right now. That if you were to think about a garden, and one of the most beautiful places that you've been in, you, you think about this place. Or, or, or maybe it's just a generic place. You think about a garden that's filled with different flowers, different trees, different shrubs, and all the rest. I'll tell you, the most beautiful garden I've ever been to, I've got a picture of it, I think. I think pull it up. It's called Monet's Garden. If you've seen any of his paintings, he was an Impressionist painter. And he lived in Giverny, France. And when I studied abroad over there in college, we went and checked out this garden. It's hard to tell the difference between his physical garden and the paintings that he painted. Because it's such a beautiful place. And it is the most beautiful garden I've ever been to in my life. There were all kinds of flowers, all kinds of plants, all kinds of trees. And when I was walking around there, and you can see in the picture, just in this picture right here, it took a lot of intentionality, a lot of effort, a lot of time to grow a garden like this. It didn't happen overnight. And this sort of thing is really applicable to our walk with the Lord. Because God is constantly working on us. God's constantly changing us, molding us more into the image of His Son, sanctifying us, growing us. Just like a tree would, would grow from a seed all the way up into full maturity. God is constantly working through that growth process that, that sometimes it, it seems like it takes so long. But there's a few things, especially with worship and discipleship, that I think we can learn and apply from from cultivating a garden to, to cultivating our own spiritual walk with the Lord. A few things that we can learn in worship and discipleship and a few analogies. One, it matters what you cultivate in the garden. How you work the, the trees and the flowers and the shrubs and, and what, how to water them. And, and the fact that they can't be neglected. I mean, you have to stay on top of them. There are times where you have to prune out weeds and you have to take out the bad stuff and, and, and leave the more desirable things in order for them to grow, and in order for there to be healthy growth. There are times of pruning in all of our lives 
where it's beneficial for us spiritually. It may not be, it may not be the thing we want to do, but it's beneficial in the long run. There's a rhythm to commit to. Any of y'all, any of y'all that have grown a garden, or any of y'all that grow vegetables and everything in the spring and summer, you know this. There's a rhythm to commit to. Going out and and pruning the weeds, going out and watering the garden, going out and picking at the right time, going out and checking on things to make the deer have, make sure the deer have them and all the rest. There's a rhythm to commit to in order for this garden to be cultivated, in order for it to grow in a more desirable way. Why is it that we commit to rhythms in life that we know are, are necessary in order for the end result to happen? among us, but we neglect the spiritual rhythms of our life and just assume that it's going to grow in the right direction. Assume that things are going to, are going to happen the way that they're supposed to happen. Listen, there's a rhythm to commit to spiritually over time. And then lastly, you have to wait patiently and trust the process. You can go out if you are doing a garden. You can plant your seeds. You can water them. And then you could go outside if you wanted to, and you could sit in a chair and watch it. <laughs> but there's not going to be a whole lot to watch, is there? Kind of like watching paint dry. It's not going to be a whole lot that actually happens. It's not going to be some sort of exciting movement that, oh man, all of a sudden there's the buds. All right, here's the tree. Oh man, here's the fruit. And you see it all just happen right in front of you. No, you realize and you understand you have to wait patiently kind of like spiritual fruit in our lives sometimes there's fruit that has to marinate it has to grow it has to cultivate over time it's like the spiritual fruit in your brothers or sisters in christ are in those that you share the gospel with sometimes you don't see them except the gospel in your timing but you never know the seeds that are planted you never know who comes along and waters those seeds you never know when the harvest is going to happen and so you commit to worship and discipleship, to prayer, to keep going, to keep moving, regardless of the circumstances around you. Because you know this, God is at work around you. Sanctification is a long process. It's full of labor and tolls and sweat. It's full of difficulty at times. But we have to remind ourselves this is the work of the Lord and he can use others to help us grow to help us cultivate that work in the long run all for his glory